In this video, I demonstrate how to blend two different materials together onto a fractured geometry to create interesting renders with transparent materials. This is the last video in a three-part series that covers fracturing geometry, adding details and noise displacement, and lastly, material blending in Redshift. This video will complete the project for an end-to-end -end experience. I will be using geometry generated from the last two videos and apply some material blending for rendering. You should be able to watch this video without watching the previous two and still be able to understand everything. The main purpose of this video was to close off the project for completeness. We're going to improve this image by adding more detail to the geometry. If you remember correctly, I had shown you this attribute, this attribute where it has the holes. I'm able, using this attribute, I'm able to isolate the areas with the holes and apply a different material to it. This is very handy. So this is our crystal material. I'm gonna, so just right click and just go to allow the editing. I'm gonna come here. This is our glass-like material, a material blend. So I wanna blend between two different materials. And RS attribute. So this is where I bring in the circle holes attribute. I'm going to use this as a color, a blend color. This will tell this circle holes is zero or one. It will tell this material blend when to use this glass glass material and when to use a second material that I will plug into here. Now this material, I'm gonna give it a milky coffee, like white-ish look. So I'm gonna stick it into this. So now the geometry has a milky coffee material attached to the holes and the rest of the material is using this glass material now once you throw on this milky coffee it's gonna look a little well for me it looked i had this weird it changed how the glass material looked like i'm not sure why it did this just i found out that if you just drop down another material try let's see this work just a second ago oh there you go just flip just flip this preset uh back and forth and it'll trigger this to update you can see that this this node is not even plugged in so it's it's something with the render view well this render view is uh marked as a legacy render view now i really should move on to the next thing that houdini and side effects has in store uh, I haven't had much time to look into the other updates that SideFX has done, has released in Houdini 18. Just being, just know that that's how you, f that's how I fixed it. I'm not sure if this works on every single system. This milky cough is a surface scattering material. So you have to go to the Redshift ROP and enable the surface scattering. So Redshift tab. SSS, that stands for subsurface scattering. And then come here, change it to ray traced in order to get that smooth. Surface scattering is used for skin materials or usually organic objects. Redshift documentation quotes multiple scattering means that scattered light gets bounced around inside the medium multiple times, which produces a softer effect than single scattering alone. However, it's very CPU intensive or, or like it's very computationally intensive. Redshift uses uh, is powered by GPU. So and come up here over here. Come up here. Sorry. And since this this glass material is linked to this one, so that's why this this glass material node has all these green uh, all the parameters are marked in green text boxes because it's linked to the one on the top level uh, remember to turn 
the refraction to one. So I believe that's the only change I made. Then you'll get this nice uh, crystal-like render. Okay, I'm going to go back up. Uh, let's go into the fractured crystal. And now I'm going to add a really simple RBD solver. So you type RBD solver. There's a RBD bullet solver that we can add right onto this salt level. So after you click it, drag it, hover it over here. And when you see the three white lines, left click, they'll automatically connect it for you. Otherwise, you'll have to like manually con connect all three. So this puts the RBD bullet solver right on this salt level, which avoids creating, setting up the .NET, .import, and all the simulation set up inside the .NET. Like that's that's all done in this one one note right here. So let's just play it and see if it works. Okay, so we have our geometry is falling to the ground. So something, it, it's working. It's not doing anything interesting because there's nothing to collide with it. So there's one thing you need to know about the RBD bullet solver. Come to the solver tab. Uh, forces over here. It automatically adds gravity. So this comes right out of the box. That's why right after I drop down the RBD bullet solver, our geometry starts falling to the ground because the gravity is automatically added. It's on added by default. So what we need is a ground plane. We come to the ground here, add ground plane. Uh, come here, ground plane, and let's put the render flag on the RBD solver so we can actually see it. Now, it's our geometry is smack in the middle of the whole grid, so it's intersecting with the ground plane. Let's lower the ground plane. Let's buy negative three. So there's room for it to drop and collide with the ground. Let's play the simulation. Okay, it works. I just want to mention one last thing. In RBD tools, there is an IO, and this is how you file cache things. So, the RBD tools has multiple inputs and multiple outputs. This way, using the RBD IO, which is actually a file cache, it will cache the geometry, the constraints, uh, the proxy geometry, and the simulation points, if necessary, easily in one node. So you don't have to have like, um, this is just for ease of convenience. So if we hook this up like this, and since this is the one we're rendering, so I'm going to put the uh, plug my out render to the first output of the RBDIO node. So this hooking the RBDIO node up like this is equivalent to having a file cache here and here, caching it like this. And like this. So it's actually caching. Like this is this mess here with these four file caches is equivalent to having this RBD IO like this. It's just ease of conven convenience. Now, the RBD IO, you have options on how you want to cache it. Only the geometry, which is this input here, I'm not sure if that will cache the proxy geometry as well. I'm guessing not. I think this only caches um, this, will only give you this, which is what the out render is hooked up to. If you picked pack geometry constraints and proxy, so this is like everything. This, this option is everything. It'll cache everything going into this node. And everything else is, all the parameters here is exactly the same thing as uh, as it were in a file cache. I usually take out the hip name because I have multiple hip files. And um, since this is an animation, I will keep the dollar sign F. Check this so it'll automatically load the next time it's uh, after it's cached. So just save it. So after that's done, 
it will automatically load from disk now. You can see that this is loading much faster. And you can also access the constraints. So we can see our constraints. Uh, or the proxy geometry. So we can see that the these um, pieces are flat cuts now compared to the high quality geometry which has noise on these cuts. And simulation points, I believe I don't have any simulation points. This is, uh, the simulation points is for the guided uh, simulation, which we did not use for this scene, which goes into this. It's the f uh, fifth input of the RBD solver. So that's going to be covered in a different video. As we've seen, the RBD interior detail node is perfect for adding extra details to objects with transparent materials. In the previous video at the very end, I have a short blurb about how it can be used for 3D printing. At first, I was trying to think of different ways to use these nodes for different things like procedural modeling. But after much brainstorming, I realized the RBD tools isn't just limited to improving renders and modeling. Sometimes we use fractured geometry to build it up as a base model for sculpting or simply as an end product for a 3D model. Later on, we may decide to 3D print the object. The fractured geometry would need to be combined together to produce a good quality tight bond. We can still print it as is, fractured, but this may end up as a bad quality 3D print due to the weak bonds between the fractured pieces. Check out the last two to three minutes in the previous video titled Interior Noise. Thank you for watching and sticking to the end.